great pleasure to welcome so many of you here at this, at this event. This is a very special occasion, and in recognition of the exceptional nature of this occasion, featuring someone that commutes to work by rocket ship, <laughs> it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to the president of Dalhousie University, Dr. Tom Travis. of being a university president is you get invited to an amazing number of lectures and presentations. One of the challenges of being a university president is your schedule doesn't allow you to go to nearly as many as you would like. But when I had the opportunity to uh, uh, schedule this particular talk into my, my uh, personal routine for the week, I was delighted because uh, I basically sent the note out to my assistant to cancel everything else and make sure that I could go to this talk. And uh, like perhaps some of you, uh, I'm really, you know, totally fascinated by the, the topic of, uh, of uh, space exploration. Um, I'm old enough, actually, uh, to have uh, very clear memories of the first man stepping onto the moon. And so I get to that on my end dates me, but it also indicates uh, how far we've come and, and how much there is to learn and do. And so, like you, I'm just uh, very eager and very excited to look forward uh, to our guest speaker's presentation this afternoon. Thank you and have a fabulous afternoon. so wrapped up in, uh, in the stuff that I'm doing and uh, it, is, it is very beneficial for me personally to have a chance to take a moment, get away from the day-to-day -day noi of, of getting ready to go command a spaceship and to come and see what's going on across the country and to talk to people that are studying and training and, uh, and uh, being what is Canada. So, so thanks for the invitation and the, the opportunity to talk today. Um, So I've been around this 320 times, uh, and starting in November of, of 2012, as I said, in 2012, I'll be going around it 16 times a day for uh, six months. I haven't done that math, but it'll be many around the world tours. We can even get on a bicycle on the space station and bicycle once around the world. It takes about 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the, the president mentioned uh, the very first walk on the moon, and remembering that, I, that's what inspired me. Watch it. Come on in, have a seat, guys. There, there's seats up front. Or please be comfortable. Don't, don't worry about it. 
um, story about the position of the sun, um, or the orientation of the building. <laughs> this, this is two years before I was born when Sputnik was first launched. Sputnik meant nothing to me, and, but I've had a chance to live in Russia about four years, uh, and over the last 20 years learned some of the language. I think it's lovely that Sputnik really means little voyager, that they called their first spaceship little traveler. And uh, it really heralded the start of space travel and uh, allowed us to do everything that has followed in, in the 50 odd years since. 50 years ago this year, this human being, under the guidance and tutelage of this human being, was the first one to leave Earth. Yuri Gagarin climbed into a rocket ship, hugely untested, in a great race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Sergei, um, uh, 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 I'll remember his last name in a minute, I don't drawing a blank, but Yuri Gagarin climbed into a rocket ship, launched from the same launch pad that I'm gonna launch from next year in Baikonur, Kazakhstan, went around the world, came back into the atmosphere, came thundering down a parachute, and about 20,000 feet pulled the handles and ejected from his, from his spaceship. The, pair, the spaceship kind of buried itself in a field just on the border of Kazakhstan, and he came floating down in a parachute, and that's how the Soviets won the original space race. Plan A was to eject from his spaceship. That's how they won. <laughs> and Sergei Korolev, he's the father of human spaceflight in Russia, brilliant man in one of the suburbs of Russia's name for him. Meanwhile, these were the, um, the Americans, of course, with uh, Al Shepard being the first American and John Glenn being the first orbit. That's what astronauts looked like 50 years ago. That's what we look like now. People from all around the world, all different languages, cultures, histories, but with the same fundamental purpose, to try and understand better what lies beyond uh, the, the, the mostly two-dimensional life we live. And when you really add uh, some, some distance to that third dimension, how does it change things? What do you see? How do we live? What do we do? And what lies out there? Uh, Canada has been involved since the beginning. Uh, Dalhousie has a really strong cooperative program with the Canadian Space Agency and has for years. Um, and we've had astronauts since 83. Mark was the first to fly. And if you have any questions, if you want to interrupt, please interrupt. I'm, I'm not here just to talk. I would much rather try and answer your questions. I was hired in this class in 92 uh, with Julie, Mike, and Dave. And then just two years ago, we uh, hired uh, David and Jeremy, who are now down in training in Houston with me um, for, for fly, an opportunity to fly in space in the future. So Canada is, we were the third nation in space. After Sputnik and the Americans, we were the third to a satellite with Ella one we have used space for our country to communicate, to understand the upper atmosphere, to look at the pollution that we're monitoring now cooperatively through MOPIN and SISAT and such. Um, we're, we are right in the forefront. And this is the vehicle that all Canadians have ridden that have gone to space so far. Uh, I've ridden on the shuttle twice. Magnificent human creation. The most capable vehicle ever built. Unbelievable. Uh, but also the most complicated flying vehicle ever built and therefore one of the hardest to maintain safely. Uh, but it is, uh, the vast majority, 70% of everybody who's ever flown in space flew on the shuttle. It has been the great first lifter of humanity to orbit. But it has flown on its full life, the United States has retired it, and now for the next several years, people that go to space ride on a Soyuz. If, uh, that's Russian for Union, and instead of carrying up to seven, it carries three, or up to three, here on the top of the Soyuz. These launch from Florida, of course, these from uh, Baikonur and Kazakhstan, where Yuri Gagarin launched. This is what a launch looks like. Three people sitting in there, watching the clock. Shuttle is just unbelievably powerful. The shuttle would just 
they would just shake the hell out of you, just take you and rattle you and squish you into your chair and, and you're shaking so fast you can't focus and this big gorilla is laying on your chest, slapping you in the face kind of feeling um, for minutes after minute. And the Soyuz is a little gentler, but pretty simple. The thing the Soyuz is different is as it stages, the, the second stage, when it shuts off, it's like, oh, this force all of a sudden, wham, it shuts off and you all float and the next engine lights and you slam back into the seat again. Like, like driving with someone who's learning to drive. And the Soyuz, from a standing start to eight kilometers a second, it takes uh, nine minutes. But as long as I've been talking, we'd all be in space. And that's the Soyuz. Yes, sir. Um, the Soyuz had a, it's been a very successful launch vehicle for the last one. Are you, are you concerned that that might impact on, on your... Uh, yeah, recently, uh, a, sh a ship similar to the Soyuz, a Progress, about a month ago, um, the third stage engine, didn't light properly, and so the vehicle uh, didn't make it into orbit, it wasn't going fast enough, fell down. It wasn't this, the Soyuz, it was a progress, different payload on top, very similar rocket. And uh, we would have survived it. Our, our ship is designed to stand on failure like that. It would have been a rough ride home, but we would have survived it. The progress doesn't come home, so it burned up. But um, the Russians are fixing it. They understand what the problem was. Uh, it was a manufacturing problem. You know, the, the design is good, because as you say, it's flown hundreds of times, but uh, sometimes you get manufacturing defects. And so they're rebuilding, retesting all their engines and putting them in. So uh, I, I don't worry about it any more or any less. I think it's actually good that they found a manufacturing defect before I got on board. So, <laughs> so that's the Soyuz. We launch. It takes us to the space station. It takes about two days. And then it stays with us there for six months. It's our lifeboat. If we get hit by a meteorite or you have a fire, you get in your Soyuz and come home. And after six months, we get in it and come back again. But of course, it takes us to the space station. And that's what we're going for, this huge international laboratory powered by the sun, uh, basically with no gravity, or at least in an environment where we can do experiments in, in microgravity. And uh, it's unprecedented. Uh, in its international nature, in the amount of electrical power we have, in the volume and the quality of the micro-G environment, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing we've built. And it, it's really been underway for a couple of years that we've been working up there. But of course, the human experience is, is what really matters. Experiments are great and it's important, but at the same time, uh, people's perceptions are what most people are interested in. And, uh, and the space station is wonderful for that. We put this big window on the bottom, this, we call it a cupola, and uh, if you picture yourself like Tracy here inside the as well, uh, the views, the, the perspective on our planet is, is so wonderful and new. Um, and as you race around, the thing is you can just glance out the window and see, I'm sure everybody recognizes where this is, you can see the border between Egypt and Israel there. Yes, you can see borders from space, there's one like that. Um, you know, the whole Sinai, and you can see where Africa is ripping away from Asia and is tearing the surface of the earth like a piece of paper. All the way to the earth. It's really distracting. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, kind of a naked eye view of Halifax. If you just look down, that's about how Halifax is going. The turning basin. I don't think it's summertime. <laughs> so it's a little chilly. But we go around the world 16 times a day. We go 8 kilometers a second, 17 and a half thousand miles an hour. Anna, would you mind flipping slides for me? Uh, this is Anna Cabanieri from the Canadian Space Agency. She's, she's uh, the one who organized with the university here to get me here. So thank you. Anna. You go to the next one, please. Have a look at this. Red, and we 
straight up as, as an empty reacts to the upper atmosphere. And it was, I mean, it was just, I couldn't believe it, that this was our planet. But this goes on all the time, and it's pouring up underneath my feet. And I was riding in the end of Canada, and uh, so I said to you guys, oh, we got to see this, the southern lights. So the arm jerked to a stop, and uh, they shut off all the lights and let their eyes adjust and took a bunch of pictures of the southern lights. It's beautiful. If you get a chance, remember to do that when you're out of the space arc, because it's really <laughs> <laughs> Space Station is a bunch of laboratories. We live in this pressurized section next to this. And uh, of course, it's, it's full of experiments. We run about 120 experiments simultaneously at any given time from all around the world. This is uh, uh, Suichi Noguchi from the Japanese Space Agency. Next, please. Uh, Bob Thurst from the Canadian Mike Barrett from the American Space Agency from NASA. All sorts of experiments on the outside, we're collecting matter and kind of particles from the universe, and looking at the world, all sorts of experiments that uh, use the microgravity environment or the vacuum of space or the, the altitude to see things. It's a great platform. We grow trees there, in fact, to, uh, to try and understand what makes wood grow the way it does, how much is caused by deformation of the wood and how much is caused by gravity so we can that's, a lot of that's the University of New Brunswick concept. Yes. Um, for those that aren't gifted enough to be astronauts, is there any way you could go to like space, like pay your way to space? Can you pay your way to space? Absolutely. Several people have bought a ticket to space, including a Canadian, the guy who, who founded Cirque du Soleil, and then Guy Laliberté. Um, Guy and I took different paths. We were born three days apart. And uh, we were both wondering what to do after high school. We both went to Europe and bummed around Europe in our late teens. And I, we both wanted to fly in space. But Guy was a street performer, and, uh, and he found he could make a good living and brought that back to Canada and set up Cirque du Soleil and has made a lot of money. I didn't have those talents, so I went to school and uh, studied a lot and became a pilot and a fighter pilot and a test pilot and got selected and trained for all those years and then uh, had a chance to fly. Guy negotiated with the Russians and bought a ticket to ride up and down. Uh, he, he doesn't say, but it's on the order of 35 million. And he trained with us for about nine months. When the, uh, when the guy stands up in front of Air Canada and says, uh, if there's a loss of pressure, the oxygen mass will dangle down, and these are the exits, you know, the little safety briefing at the start. For the Soyuz, that safety briefing lasts about nine months. And uh, so Guy did the nine month safety briefing, got himself safe, and then he flew up on one Soyuz and down on the other. He spent about 10 days in space, 35 million. So yeah, you can. <laughs> Next please. We train, I train all around the world. Uh, the experiments come from all around the world. And it's not that I'm doing, or at least I'm not evaluating the science, but I'm the guy there fixing things and making it happen and doing the electrocardiograms and, and taking the core samples of muscle tissue and all, and running the experiments and fixing them when they break. So, um, so we, we do lots of training around the world in, uh, in experimentation. Yes? I don't know, everyone out there probably has to agree with but do you find um, that one of the most critical is the um, problem solving that um, the, the astronaut selection is, is a long iterative process. We don't hire very many. In Canada, typically, when we have a recruitment of five or 6,000 people applying, they choose two or three. Um, so that same filter is everywhere. And it, it tends to sort of spit out the same sort of person, no matter what country you're from. It's people with good brain, healthy body, and uh, an advanced technical education uh, in all different fields, veterinarians, medical doctors, engineers, physicists, mathematicians. Um, but then also an operation experience. We want someone who can fix stuff when it breaks, and uh, who can recognize when an experiment is not going to work or is going to work, or uh, the operational sense that goes with it. Average age to get hired as an astronaut is 36, because it takes about that long to get your qualifications where they will even look at you. And um, and we hire those two new guys, Jeremy and David. Jeremy is an astrophysicist and a medical doctor. I'm sorry, David is an astrophysicist and a medical doctor. And uh, Jeremy is a, a CF-18 pilot and a physicist. And they're good guys. <laughs> Next one. Uh, we put together a lot of education components of what we're doing. And we've built a program for middle schools and high schools uh, using an avatar where a student can create their own avatar, log in. They built this kind of spooky avatar of me, it's very realistic. <laughs> if anybody ever makes your avatar for you, it's kind of uh, a little bit unnerving to look at. Someone spent a lot of time seeing how your mustache moves when you talk. 
So we train our clients and on flying the Soyuz and operating the Soyuz as part of the education program, and we'll be running that uh, starting in the spring, but really starting next fall. Next season. Of course, a large part of my life is training to fly the Soyuz. I'm basically the Soyuz pilot. Uh, Roman Romanenko will be in the middle as the commander, and I'll be seated beside him as the Soyuz pilot. We fly the Soyuz in Russia, not in English, so the training is very long and intense, and it's a really small space. Um, but that's uh, myself, Roman, and Tom Marshman, the American. The three of us are flying the Soyuz together. And then, we'll, so Roman commands the Soyuz, and then I'll command the space station. Uh, our training, of course, the Soyuz is our lifeboat. Um, when we come back into the atmosphere the next week's end, uh, it's a wicked ride. And so we do training in a centrifuge because you manually fly the Soyuz home. And you can land pretty accurately, like a five kilometer square. We have landing sites all over the world. Um, so we, uh, we ride in there. And then we could land in the water, which is uh, just like the NASA satellite that randomly fell to Earth this week. You are mostly land in the water, because we're three quarters water. So we train to land in the water in the mountains. We do mountain survival training, Arctic training, desert training, because you can land anywhere. Uh, sometimes you have to do spacewalks. Right now it's scheduled that we'll do two or three while I'm on the space station. I've done two. Um, in fact, I was Canada's first spacewalker, and that's a picture of me outside on my first day as a spacewalker. It is the most phenomenal experience of my entire life. Uh, to be, uh, I've, I've been lucky, I've done some interesting things, but to be uh, holding onto a human creation with one hand, very gently, to be in between the endless, velvety blackness of the universe uh, and the world, roaring by next with all the colors and textures, and the only link you have with humanity is the fingertips of one hand, and then you're alone in the universe. It's a phenomenal place to be. And meanwhile, you've got work to do, like build Canada 2, but, but it's, it's just <laughs> incredible. Next, please. We train underwater. We have a whole space station underwater. We use the water to simulate weightlessness. Next, please, Anna. And uh, there's Guy and the Roger building the suit around my body. We pressurize the suit. Next, please. And, uh, and then we get lifted by a crane into this huge pool. I did this on Friday when we trained underwater. We used virtual reality as well uh, to simulate moving around the outside of the space station. And all our simulators, as you well know, especially for the students here, all simulators are wrong. Make sure that is a fundamental precept of your understanding of simulation. All simulators are wrong. And the key thing that you have to do is find out the part of it that is right and the part of it that is wrong so you don't draw the wrong conclusions. In my case, it's like death. And so uh, we constantly try and look at it and go, okay, the piece of this that is right, or this virtual reality, or this underwater scene, that is right is this one. So I need to internalize that and integrate it in my head so when I go do it for real, that I haven't drawn the wrong conclusion. We've had a couple of space missions basically bust or near bust because we believe a simulation. And we've crashed many airplanes as we believe simulations. So simulations are necessary for the best we can do. But if you believe them, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Next, please. Uh, we grab uh, resupply ships with the Canada Arm 2. This is what got us on board. We built it all across the country. The money was spent in Canada, and we provided it as part of the space station program. And that's why we can put experiments on the station. That's why there are Canadians on board, because that was our ticket on board with the money spent in the country. And it built the space station. It's a wonderful invention. We grab satellites. I have a nice picture from Lake Ontario, Finger Lakes, uh, Long Island, Cape Cod. Um, distracting. But uh, that's a Japanese satellite. Next, please. We train in all different laboratories, uh, simulating. We don't use real views normally. We use computer views just because of lighting and distance. But uh, uh, robotics training with a seven degree of freedom arm for a free flying satellite is complicated. And, and there are no good visual references. And there's no Small trees in the distance, big trees up close, you know how hard things are. Everything's weird and lighting is bizarre. So, so we do a lot of training. Uh, six months in space, your body suffers horribly. Uh, you're, you start to redissolve your scalp immediately. The first time you pee in space, your urine is full of minerals and calcium from your scalp. For whatever reason, your body senses without gravity immediately and says, hmm. I'm going to stop building a skeleton for this guy because he doesn't need it. He's like, why would he need this big skeleton? And we don't, it's, it's a form of osteoporosis. We don't really understand the control mechanism within the body. 
But we have learned that if you can load it up both cardiovascularly and your impact um, and, and resistive exercise, next please, Anna, that you can, um, you can maintain bone density. The density changes a little, the structure of the bone changes a little. But we can basically come back now after six months with no significant bone loss, where we used to have uh, debilitatingly significant bone loss. So that's good for, for the students here to go to Mars, because we can sustain um, health indefinitely that we've learned on the space station. Um, Psychology is a big thing. I'm the commander of the crew that I'm, for the last few months I'm up there, I'm commanding. And um, one of the things I've discussed with my crew is, what are we going to do when one of our crew members loses a family member while we're in space? You know, it, it sounds gruesome, but boy, it's one of the things you want to simulate and think about. And don't just wait for it to happen and then go, oh crap, we never thought about that. So, I mean, how do you get together as a crew? And of course, we need to build a very deep bond and resource amongst ourselves before we go to improve the odds of doing it right when we get there. But I, I've asked each person to go through the process in their mind. And, and of course, getting together around food, it's a great international, natural thing to do. We're bringing lots of Canadian food. We've been a nationwide uh, looking for suggestions online for Canadian food to bring. The food's kind of crappy. Um, jelly, fish, and um, sardines. Uh, tortillas, but they don't last very long. I think that might be spinach. Um, anyway, everything's dehydrated or canned or um, irradiated, so the food's okay, but uh, I wouldn't become an astronaut for, this, for the food. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we weigh ourselves. It's just got a spring inside. Katie releases the trigger, and by the frequency of the oscillation, you can back out her mass. So we weigh ourselves. Of course, you want to know if you're losing weight or gaining weight, and it's deceptive. If you strip yourself naked in weightlessness, you look different. <laughs> so looking in the mirror is not necessarily going to, because, you know, the fluid shift and nothing's being pulled down by gravity, so you, you look pretty good in weight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the only way we can really tell how we're doing is to weigh ourselves, and uh, that's what Katie's doing. Thanks. Six months, you've got to get a haircut, and uh, that's Katie cutting Dima's hair, so we have to train as a barber, and she's got, like, a flow bee attached to a vacuum there. <laughs> that's how we cut our hair, so... So we get bad haircuts by the time we come home. But it's also a place to be human. And robots do things really well. But, um, but they don't get ticker tape parades, and, and they don't give good talks, and they, and you know, music and culture and art and that, you know, that's what magazines and, and movies and stories and humanity is all about. And uh, this is a new human experience leaving our planet on a permanent basis as a species. And uh, we have a Canadian guitar up there, Larry Vey. Uh, I brought a guitar up to Mir, and it stayed up there for four and a half years, 22 and a half thousand times around the world. I played a couple bands, and uh, we made my patch for this next mission in the shape of a guitar pack. Um, because there's, there's a lot of musicians, and, and lousy musicians like me out there, but music is music, and it's a great way to express a, a different side of a whole new human experience. The uh, time to come home after six months, the Soyuz is three pieces, the sort of the living quarters, the engine, and then the piece that survives the entry, the, the uh, or the uh, entry apparatus, or landing module, and that's where we sit next to these, and we're crammed together. Uh, three people, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, shoulder to shoulder, and we re-enter going this way. So the G pushes into our back, not down to our feet, but into our back, so that the blood doesn't drain from our head and our eyes. And it's about 3,000 degrees C on the outside of the vehicle, on the way out. You're, you're inside the, uh, the plasma field, it's like you're in a blast furnace. You're in, you're in you're a meteorite. About uh, 10 kilometers up, parachutes open, hopefully. And um, otherwise, you'll only have to worry for a very short period. <laughs> and as a friend of mine said once, if it happens, just point your toes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, this is coming down to land in Kazakhstan, us underneath the parachute. You can see the rescue forces driving across the step, uh, coming out to, be able to meet the vehicle. This picture is taken from one of the rescue helicopters. Next, please. This is uh, what the landing looks like. It's harsh. Now, we, we go, we're like, oh! uh, Right now, 
flight, they're, they launched one of these cargo vehicles on a test flight. We're going to launch them up to the space station in a few months. And uh, eventually, hopefully, they will grow it into a vehicle that people can ride in. For now, Americans do not have a vehicle to take people to space with them, just the Russians and the Chinese. But uh, hopefully, it'll be Dragon or one of the other companies that, um, that builds one. It'll be a few years, but they'll, they'll have a vehicle soon. Next, please, Anna. And the way it works is we fly this up close, we reach out with the arm tube, we grab it, attach it to the station, and, uh, and, and unload all the gear. The Americans just approved this huge heavy lift rocket. It's a big thing in the States. This thing is, is seven to five lift capability, like the Apollo rocket, more than the shuttle. It uses a lot of shuttle technology, shuttle solids, shuttle liquids, and uh, it can carry uh, people to Mars. It's got that type of energy. So this is under development now in the States. And hopefully, you know, through all the vagaries of politics and time, uh, this will be the vehicle that they will build in the next six or seven years and uh, take us through. China's launching this week. Um, this is the first Chinese to fly in space, and in Yang Li Wei, a great guy. And uh, Fei Jun Mom, who's good friends. And this is um, what they're launching this week, is their first space station. Uh, they I've heard this week, of course, they haven't been phoning me to tell me when the launch is going to be, but um, it, it, it should go later this week. And I wish them all the success in the world. They're learning how to build a space station, how to run docking systems, rendezvous tracking, all of that stuff. And they'll send people to go live on a temporary basis over the next few years on their space station with the intent to then build a space station and, and go further. And hopefully, just like with the Russians in the 80s and in the 90s, we'll find a way to start uh, cooperating. But for now, it's very much a nationalistic uh, proof of capability for them. And uh, I really hope we find a way to cooperate over the next 10 or 15 years. And uh, begs the question, where do you go next? A lot of choices, some, some better than others. Next, Susanna. Um, the, the big ones out in the distance aren't so good, but, but you know, the moon makes sense. Of course, it's three days away. Um, some of the asteroids that have risen by the Earth, they make a lot of sense. We don't really even know what most asteroids are made of. We're guessing based on a couple we've seen and the reflectivity and the meteorites we pick up. But, uh, boy, if you look in between Mars and Jupiter, there's a lot. And, of course, a bunch of them come in, and the Earth has been pummeled by them in the past, so it would behoove us to to know, you know, the dinosaurs looked up from their vegetables and died, and they didn't have a space program. So we, we would do better if we could at least figure out maybe what we might do if we see one coming at us. And so, so there's lots of possible destinations. Next, please. Um, but how do you even say for an asteroid? We've been to the moon. We have a pretty good understanding of how to explore that. But how do you explore an asteroid? How do you sample it? How do you fly next to it? How, do you, how would you ever deflect one? What are they made of? How deep is the dust? All the stuff, we just, we're just sort of guessing mostly. And uh, are we going to attach pitons to it and build a structure to climb? Is that how you sample it? What sort of little vehicle do you need to build to fly around the asteroid so that you can approach it safely? And so we're doing a lot of research. We use underwater to simulate the near weightlessness. Um, uh, there's a, next please. There's an underwater habitat that I've lived in at the bottom of the ocean. And we use that to simulate the psychological stresses of being in space. I've commanded a crew down there. And David St. Jacques, one of our new guys, is going to be down there in a couple weeks, living there for a few weeks. And they'll be doing asteroid exploration type research. Next, please, Anna. And then we have little vehicles that we use to explore deep sea that are built up in Vancouver called Deep Workers by Newton Cohen. And uh, next. And um, I've been flying these around. There's some pretty cool lakes on the BC we've been exploring. But the whole operations concept of a vehicle like this one, you can learn a lot from it in, um, in how to build a similar thing for exploring around an asteroid. So the agency's been involved in that as well. And you know, there's where does that little pebble? You know, there's we have a, a super underground. 500 years ago, we thought we were the center of the universe and everything revolved around us. And a picture like this really got you killed back then. But, uh, you know, the more we learn, the more it puts our, ourselves into perspective. And, and the more you realize that we really ought to understand the health of this planet, we, we can't just be looking at this planet. We, we've got to understand where it fits into everything else. One burp out of this thing, it significantly affects us. Um, and tiny little changes have huge impacts, of course, on the weather and the climate and the atmosphere. Some's natural. Some is man-made, and, and you know it's like taking somebody's temperature for.
three seconds and then trying to diagnose their whole life. And, and you can draw some conclusions, but you draw a lot of false ones. So exploring the solar system with robots and with people uh, is where we're headed. Lots of designs possible for it. Uh, the Vasmir engine, which is one of the vehicles that could get us to Mars as quickly as 40 days. Uh, some of the hardware is built by a company here in Halifax for this. And it's, it's in the research phase. It's by no means a vehicle that, that's funded or, or built. But it's a leading contender um, by a company uh, called Ad Astra. And I think it's not telling you town that's doing the work on that. So there's, you know, there's fundamental work and design and uh, actual construction going on for a lot of different spaceships and ideas and, and exploration vehicles. But meanwhile, this is reality. We are living and working as a species off of our planet and trying to use this to understand how machines work for a long time without gravity, um, to better understand our planet, what happens to the body so we can stay up indefinitely, and try and learn all these lessons while we're close to home before we really head over the horizon and, uh, and have to deal with all the consequences where you can't turn around. So I think that's all my pictures. I try to post pictures every day of, uh, of the training that we're doing. And we, we do things maybe you wouldn't think of. And so, thanks, Anna. And so um, if you're interested in what the training is like, please just have a look, because I, I try and uh, show little details that, uh, that maybe aren't very well known of what training and living as an astronaut is like. And it's, it's a kind of unique life. And I'm looking for a way to try and explain it to Canadians while I'm busy um, training for it. So please have a look if you're interested. That's all the pictures I brought and movies, but I would be happy if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer. Yes? How do I stay in touch with my family? Um, uh, my eldest son went to Acadia and uh, did political science, uh, and he uh, logically now is a professional poker player living in China. <laughs> <laughs> Has been there for six years. Thank you educational system. And, uh, <laughs> my middle son went to uh, Mount Allison, and uh, he's now doing an MBA in Mannheim over in Germany. Uh, my daughter went to Queens, and she's doing her PhD in psychology in, um, in Ireland, right now in Dublin. So I have one in China, one in Germany, one in Ireland, and my wife uh, back and forth to Canada and Houston. So uh, I just I say that roundabout answer because I don't think how I communicate with my family is going to change at all. You know, I send them emails. I phone them sometimes and we Skype sometimes. And we can do all those things from the space station. Not always. It's sort of like maybe uh, on a farm or something where you don't have the super high speed everything and it goes down sometimes. It depends on our satellite link and what's going on. But most of the time, we have two-way video available. We always have email. We do packet emails, not 24-7. And, um, and then we have a phone number. I could phone any of you from space station. It's weird to get a phone call from space station. The worst part is there's a delay, right? Because it has to relay through a couple satellites. And so typically you phone somebody, and the first thing you have to say is, don't hang up! Because they go, hello? 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 Anybody there? Right again. You can't call me. But it's a fairly complicated lash-up, as you can imagine. But what we do... So we do have the capability to stay in touch pretty well. Yes, sir. Yeah, you spoke to the robots issue in terms of long time space. Are there other health issues that are going to come into play on the trip to the long term Mars? One of our biggest, well, radiation, of course, as soon as you get out of the protective field of the Earth, radiation is wicked. And we don't really know. We have not sent good um, sort of biomedical simulators beyond the, the magnetic protective field that is around the Earth and the Moon here, you know. We don't really know just how bad it's going to be. And so that comes into then how heavily do you have to shield your spaceship? Do you, do you surround the whole thing with water or a big protective, you know, you don't want to make a lead spaceship, but what else can you do? Or, or can we build some sort of electromagnetic field that could protect us just like the Earth is protected? So that's one big thing, radiation. Um, one of our current problems we're really struggling with is vision. We've had a significant change in vision with a pretty good percentage of the population of astronauts on space station. We think it's caused by the, by the extended fluid shift that happens when you take away gravity. You know, your body, of course, is, is trying to get the blood back up to your head all the time. And your body squeezed like a balloon squeezed from the bottom. Your body is constantly squeezing the blood to your head. 
and, um, and, and it's a fine balance. When you have a long-term perpetual change in that, we think there's, there's a physiological change along the optic nerve or within the pressure of the eyeball itself. And, and we're now at a statistical level where we have to address it. It's not just guys getting older and losing their vision. It's, it's something being caused by either weightlessness or the radiation or the fluid shift or the diet. We don't really know, but we're looking at that. So there's, your vision gets worse. Um, you lose, your body evolves, not just your skeleton, but you know, to drink this water seems simple. But think of what your body does, or if it's a cup of coffee, when you, when you just grab it and bring it up to your mouth. That seems so simple. But I am fighting gravity. I am tracking something in a high acceleration environment, a nice straight line right to my mouth. I'm balancing it so it doesn't spill. All the little things that are the closed loop between my eye, my fingertips, and the arm. You don't need any of those in space, right? Because it's weightless. You can float it in your mouth. You never have to fight gravity. You don't have this big vector this way while you're moving something this way. And so a lot of the fine muscle control either gets forgotten or gets redissolved. And that has to be regrown. A lot of the fast twitch muscle fiber changes. Um, your balance system forgets. You can't balance with your eyes closed when you get home. Your blood pressure regulation system significantly changes. And so all of those things have to readapt. And some come back in hours, some come back in days, and some come back in months and years. Uh, but typically we're finding about day for day. Six months in space, so long as you maintain your bone density, um, then uh, about six months on Earth, and you'll be pretty much back to where you start. That's one of the things we've learned from space station. What is the proportion of the CSA resources that will be allocated for doing experiments for the space station? Of the space station resources for the Canadians? Versus uh, uh, working for exploration. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, we run out. It's almost like it's a quantum question because you can't have a tenth of an experiment. And so uh, you kind of decide what sort of experiment you're going to put on board. And some of them are pure science, some of them are pure engineering, and some of them are pure exploration. And we have a certain number on board at any given time. And some, Canada has, has done all of those over time. We've built the microwave gravity isolation mount. We've done a lot of physiological experiments. We've done radiation dosimeter experiments. Um, we're doing experiments now in order to be able to do medical evaluations of the blood on orbit, not have to bring the samples home to do the real-time evaluation of the blood. So there's a big suite of things going on. But the percentage is more driven at the project level than I think it is by any hope. And, and so I don't know the, the direct answer to your question. But if you take it over the, all of the 16 or 17 countries and over the life of station, you know, it's a much bigger, uh, more logical balance. But it goes with politics, too. You know, the country says, oh, we don't want the science, we want exploration. And two years later, they go, exploration? No, we want science. And you know, we're, we're the guys trying to keep the lights on and the machinery running. And uh, yeah, it's just a fact of life. Yes, sir? Um, when you speak about the uh, physiological changes, have the um, uh, neurological changes been uh, mapped out as well? I'm thinking um, they could be looking at neuroplasticity in the same thing. We so have the baseline neurological uh, network back lit yeah. off versus six months later. There, is there any <coughs> Before we built the space station, we had laboratories in the back of the shuttle. We called them space labs. They were built in Europe. And Canada ran several experiments in there. And uh, one of them in the 90s was actually targeted just at that. It was called Neuralab, the whole mission. And it was all about brain study, uh, function, neuroplasticity, changes, physiological and psychological. And um, there was a Canadian on board, a Canadian doctor, astronaut named Dave Williams. And so yeah, they did an ex extremely detailed study. They were up as long as the shuttle could stay up in the order of two and a half weeks, um, and uh, they, they worked 24 hours a day for the whole time in the back studying just that. And I think what we found is that uh, it is not a limit. There are some changes, but it is not one of the things that keeps us from staying in space for an indefinite period. And, and the changes are not uh, fundamental. 
so that, so that we can survive it as a species. Our brain is just tough enough in our neurological function. But it's not my area of expertise, but the answer is definitely out there. And if you just go to Neurolab, it was STS-90. Um, it's all been published, and, and uh, there's been a tremendous amount of research done in that area. In the back, in the purple shirt. Uh, yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, of course, the, as we've been talking, the lack of gravity takes its toll. So why not create gravity? And if, the only way we can do that is, as you say, centrifugally. And we have lots of centrifuges on board at, at the experiment level. You know, we'll spin one sample and keep the other one weightless. There's been talk of doing it at the individual level, of when you get on the bicycle, of having it spin around an axis so that you could, um, you know, for a little while, you get gravity. We also have a, a thing that we strap on our lower body, a lower body negative pressure device, and it pulls a, a lower pressure around your lower body, so it draws all the blood down into your lower body, so that then you're, that's sort of like standing up, and your body goes through some of the reactions to try and um, combat it. But there are big advantages to being weightless. And a lot of the science we do takes advantage of the fact that you're weightless. So, and we're finding that we can stay healthy indefinitely in weightlessness. So, but also, if you wanted to spin the whole spaceship, you know, like 2001 with the big rotating rings, the amount of metal that you have to launch to orbit is, is absolutely prohibitive. You cannot build something that big. And we've talked about, um, you put your engine on one end and your spaceship on the other, and you just attach them with a tether and they spin around each other. And then and your spaceship, uh, you know, like a ball on a string, your spaceship has gravity. That's great until a meteorite hits your tether. Wee! Off you go. <laughs> toast. So, and we've done several tethered experiments in space. Almost, all, as far as I know, all of them have failed because of um, it's so hard to build a good enough tether. Either it breaks on its own or it breaks due to impacts. So, yeah, we've looked at it, um, but to this point, it's more an advantage than a disadvantage to have the weightlessness. Yes, sir. Uh, how long can you stay in your this is a guy named Steve Robinson, good guy. He has a PhD out of Stanford. Uh, he started his musical career as a banjo player. And uh, he plays stand-up bass in one of the bands I'm in and lead guitar, good guy. He went underneath the space shuttle after the, uh, the first flight after the Columbia accident. And he's the one who reached underneath the uh, space shuttle and, and pulled the, uh, there was some problems underneath the fix it by hand, riding on the end of Canada. So Steve's a nice picture of Steve here. Um, the suit is a one-person spaceship, and it's completely self-contained. I don't know if you can see. If you look down, coming down from between his legs, you can see that very thin filament. We're attached by like a clothesline, so that if we went tumbling off into space, the clothesline's about 85 feet long, and it would at least keep us from um, naming us as a satellite. <laughs> as the Chris Hadfield satellite floating around. <laughs> If that breaks, then on your back you wear this jet pack, and if you go tumbling off into space and your, your mind fails, then you uh, pull a little lever and a joystick pops out in front of you and you turn it on, and then you, you have a, a finite amount of nitrogen gas, 8,000 psi nitrogen gas, that you can fly yourself back over uh, to grab onto the space station before you run out of fuel. And that's, it's okay in the day, but in the night, it, uh, you know, the space station is where the stars aren't, so it's hard. There's no cues, it's just visual. So we have to qualify doing that. But the real limiting factor in the suit is uh, either battery or oxygen. And uh, we resupply oxygen, but we also use lithium hydroxide to uh, clean the carbon dioxide out of the air. And either we have a buildup of CO2, we start using up O2, or the batteries that power and start running down. The suit's good for about nine or 10 hours. And, but after nine or 10 hours, there's no food in there. There's a little water bag, You've been in the suit for two or three hours before you went outside. It's time to use the bathroom. Um, and you're whipped. This is a physically wicked thing to do. This is a pressure suit where every motion of your body you have to fight uh, the suit. And uh, it's, it's like uh, doing a hard physical workout, circuit training in the gym for six hours. You come in just, just pump. And it's not comfortable. You come in bleeding. So it, it is a very physical, it's one of the reasons we exercise on station, because if stuff breaks, you have to go out and fix it. And your body needs to be strong and, and cardiovascularly fit enough to, to go do this. So typically, we plan our spacewalks for no longer than six and a half hours. My first one was eight hours. 
and I came in shaking like a leaf. It was hard, but fun. <laughs> yes? Um, I know you took part of this question already, but what sort of advice would you give to someone interested in joining the um, I decided to be an astronaut uh, on the day that they walked on the moon, July 20th, 69, and I was uh, I was nine years old. I, I probably wasn't the only guy in the world that decided he was going to be an astronaut that day, but I thought, wow, I'm going to grow up to be something. Why don't I grow up to be Neil Armstrong? He looks like a pretty cool guy. That's got a great job, and I would like to do that. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, at the time, Canada had a very fledgling space program. We had no human space program. It was either the Soviets or the Americans. So I'm like, geez, I don't want to be a Soviet, and I, I don't want to be an American, so what do I do? So I just thought, well, Neil and Buzz, they were both uh, well-educated, have kept their bodies in shape, and um, were pilots. So I thought, well, I'll do that. So I uh, joined Air Cadets, learned to fly airplanes as a teenager. Uh, went to university. I, like Guy, I didn't know what I was doing after high school. I couldn't decide, do I really want to become, you know, what sort of pilot, what am I going to do? Is the Canada Space Program doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. You know, what do I want to do? But I decided while I was coming around Europe that I would do this. I joined the Canadian military, went to the military colleges, did mechanical engineering, went through pilot training, got all the way through, became a fighter pilot, then uh, became a test pilot, uh, went did went Another couple other universities did advanced training in aerospace, and then um, uh, was a test pilot when I got hired as an astronaut. So I kind of did exactly the Buzz and Neil thing. Right? I was a military fighter pilot, test pilot, engineer, and that route, that's what Jeremy Hansen was basically. Although he uh, did a master's in physics, but basically that. Um, so now, if you're thinking of being a Canadian astronaut, it, at least it's a career field. You know, it's not like, hey, I'd like to be uh, Superman, you know, because <laughs> at least there is a Canadian, there's no Canadian Superman, but there, there at least a Canadian astronaut is, is one of the jobs the government offers. And um, once in a while we have a recruitment. We're going to have another recruitment soon, I think. Uh, not real soon, but if you just look at the demographics and the timing and such, no guarantee when, but well, my guess is NASA just announced they're going to have another recruitment because we need more people. Russia just got a new class, and so you know, it goes through a slow cycle, but we'll get there. So the opportunity will exist. The question is, what improves your odds so when the 5,500 people apply, you're one of the two that gets selected? Number one is an advanced technical education, any field, uh, advanced technical. It's not so much that we want to hire a particle physicist, but we want to hire a person who has proven the ability to learn complicated things in an original way at a really high level. And one of our measures of that is an advanced technical education. The second is physical. We have to pass the hardest physical in the world to keep our job. As a space station crew member, the stuff they look at is, is well, it's rude, but it's also uh, ridiculous. You know, everything has to be just right or you can't go. So part of that is fitness, part of it is just luck. So you need, you need to be, uh, be born with a good body, but also take care of it. And then uh, the third is operational experience, because we just don't want to hire really fit students. We want to hire people who have then proven their ability to make good decisions where their consequences matter. And that can be financial, it can be uh, life or death, like a medical doctor, it can be uh, operational, like a fighter pilot, you know, there, there's lots of areas. So, and then that'll whittle it down to like 500 people out of the 5,000. And then now you're looking at the subtleties. What else do you do? What languages do you speak? Where have you been? What have you done with your life? What, do you, what type of person are you? Are you going to be able to spend six months on station as a functioning crew member in a really odd psychological environment? Um, you know, then we're trying to pick, then we get we have a richness. I think uh, Anna was involved in the selection process, but uh, it is so heartening to be part of that process and see the great young Canadians that are out there. I mean, it's just, what a, what a great place we live in, the people that we produce, the, the humility and the depth of skill that it brought forward was, uh, was astounding, and, uh, and we only picked two. But um, so that's what I would recommend: uh, keep in shape, get advanced technical education, and then look for work afterwards that will really prove uh, your decision-making, <coughs> operational sense of things, and then uh, apply. And how much time do we have to go? I think I need to end it right there because. Um,
because fortunately or unfortunately, we're, I'm giving one more talk tonight at the Discovery Center, and, uh, and then I think we're going to go talk to CDC or something. Um, I'm going to be on the Rick Mercer Report next week. It should be fun. <laughs> uh, I fly an old jet at air shows in Canada. Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to link the history. When the 100th anniversary of flight here in Nova Scotia happened two years ago, up at the deck, uh, I got to fly as part of that. And so to link the history of aerospace in Canada right through to the present and through the future is nice. And, and uh, Rick Mercer came to one of the shows where I was with this historic Canadian airplane. He's a fun guy, great, great, he's a good Canadian, so I'll be on that show next week. But mostly, I'll be keeping my head down working. Uh, launch, I'm the backup for the launch next spring, in case uh, one of them sprains their leg or something. And then I'll be launching November 26th of, uh, what say? November 26th of uh, next year, of 2012, and on station for six months, landing in the spring of 13. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to it's been a real treat, and uh, I'm really proud uh, of what Canada's done in this basic program. We are not the big player, but we are a vital player. We're extremely respected and trusted, and it's due to work that, uh, that we do here. It's due to work we do at the agency and all the people across the country. It's such a treat for me to be able to come uh, and meet with folks. So thanks for the opportunity. Please.